yeah, we know this, we know this. Or if it's going a little too fast, say, hold on, what are you talking about here? And back off a second. And so just to give you a little bit of background, um, I was kind of born in a very environmentally um, acute uh, or astute family. My mom is a land use environmentalist, and my dad is um, kind of considered one of the fathers of global warming. He's an Arctic explorer and oceanographer. And so I spent my life growing up between Seattle and the Arctic Circle. And um, so, you know, your life comes back around in strange forms as, it, as time goes on. So I've always had this passionate interest in trying to understand the environment better, part so I could just argue with my parents more. But also because I thought, you know, where is this all kind of heading in terms of human health? And also, how do we actually evolve and change and adapt to our environment? How many of these insults can we respond to appropriately, and how many can we not respond to in any sort of predictable fashion? And really spells impending doom. And in order for me to kind of answer these questions, I felt like I needed to have a better mechanistic understanding because being able to find association without getting at the underlying causation wasn't really in tune with the, with the type of science most of us are trained in. And so that's kind of the background of how I've gone these routes. And so the examples we're going to talk about today in terms of environmental exposures and the epigenome are things that I think have broad implications to how do we adapt and respond. And so we're going to go through a very localized ecologic niche example, that's going to be maternal high fat diet exposure. And then we're going to move it to a little bit broader ecological niche and we're going to talk about specifically tobacco exposure and come up with an example of when we've been able to identify genomic loci that team up with epigenomic events that really render phenotypic susceptibility. So in my laboratory, we're really interested in all of these different mechanisms that enhance the diversity of our genomic inheritance. And like I hinted at, some of these are things that have immediate adverse health consequences. Some of these may actually be long-term adaptive responses that when we encounter something we haven't seen before, we go through a series of heritable changes that actually enable us to deal with it in an effective fashion. And trying to figure out where those you know, what's evolution and what's destruction is not an easy task before us. So we actually have a number of different things we look at in my laboratory. Um, we really started off looking at epigenomics, um, and we've expanded that out over time. We do quite a bit of comparative genomics now, which we'll talk about at the very end. We look at mitochondrial DNA. So for those of you that don't think about mitochondrial DNA, it's our maternal genome. It's clonally inherited. We only get it from our mom. It's actually kind of a, a refuge of our old bacterial counterparts. It's a circular DNA molecule. It's about 16 and a half kgs in most ethnic groups. And it actually goes through very high rates of mutational changes. About 10% of all our mitochondrial DNA in our body is different from the other 90%. That's called um, uh, um, heteroplasmy. And this degree of heteroplasmy actually changes throughout our lifetime. So we accumulate these mutations in effective ways. And then about a third of my laboratory now is devoted to issues around the microbiome, which I'll just touch on at the very end. We call it our second genome. It outnumbers our own genome about 150 to 1 in. It's an incredibly important genome that we're just starting to grasp with. What unifies all these studies is that we specialize in, in high throughput omics analysis. Um, we take very large volumes of data and we try to distinguish signal from noise. And, you know, I will tell you, I'm a card-carrying, practicing maternal fetal medicine physician. You know, I skedaddled out at the end of the day in clinic yesterday. Um, and I did not know how to do any of this when I was a resident. Um, I've learned this. And so for those of you who are residents in the crowd, if you don't know how to do this now, that's all cool. You'll get a chance. You'll figure it out. It takes nothing but time and devotion and a passion to taking care of more than just one patient at that you really say, I want to take care of the population as a whole. I want to leave my career and my field in better shape than I found it. And I'm not going to be able to do that if I just focus on the patient. So that's my little pitch for uh, Never Stop Learning. When I first got involved with the Microbiome Project, I had to Google it. I had no idea what microbiome was. Um, 
So what really constitutes environmental exposure? So environmental exposures really are a form of observational science at their core. And while we kind of diss observational science sometimes, we have to go back to it over and over and over again. Because that's where our clues into how to look for something really start. And so observational science becomes incredibly important. And here's a great example. So we know that you can have a very diverse birth phenotype, but you can have common later in life risks. And so I'll bring up some examples that we as obstetricians are very comfortable talking about. So we have kind of two extremes on the birth weight cohort. We have small for gestational age babies and we have large for gestational age babies. And this is actually the vignettes of science I'm going to present to you today. Our large for gestational age babies tend to, we look at things around maternal obesity and diet, I'm going to show you some of our non-human primate data we've developed over the last eight years that really help us discern this out. Our small for gestational age babies, for us, we're going to talk about this in the context of maternal smoking because it's a great gateway in figuring this all out. But regardless how different these babies look when they're born, they both start to have immediate neonatal consequences that start to be a little bit of the same. They both are prone to hypoglycemia, and the more hypoglycemic you are, the more difficulty you have maintaining your core body temperature as an infant. For those of us who work globally, we see this all the time with these babies. A very, very high time if you don't have incubators keeping babies at a normal thermic regulation, in part because of their glucose levels. But this actually gets more and more pronounced. So starting in the early pre-adolescent window, whether you're a large for gestational age baby or you're a small for gestational age baby, you start to see an increased risk of obesity in these kids. That escalates on as they move through adolescence. You start to see early onset of type 2 diabetes, insulin resistant driven diabetes. And then as they move on into their 20s and 30s, if they're women, we start to see a little bit higher rate of preeclampsia. We see a little bit higher rate if they didn't have type 2 diabetes, if they have gestational diabetes. They move on out of reproductive lifespans. And now they look a lot to say there are cardiovascular risks. And now you've converged on this common phenotype of birth with totally different phenotypes. Well, now that doesn't make a lot of sense unless you start getting at the mechanisms. And maybe the reason why eventually over your lifetime you emerge into this common phenotype of risk for obesity, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic disease, you have a higher rate of stroke, you have higher levels of hypertension, is because some of those early molecular mechanisms actually converge down on common pathways, and that's what leads you to your eventual risk. So let's think about gene transcription. Who hasn't thought a lot about gene transcription? Mm -hmm. so that's cool. <laughs> All right, but it's really easy. We just turn things on or off. That's just a fancy way of light switch up, light switch down. All right. So there are different ways we turn on and off genes. So for a long time, we thought the main way we turned on and off genes was whether or not you had a certain nucleotide sitting in an important region, be it a promoter or an enhancer. And that genomic variation was what regulated whether the gene was on or off. Now, if you think about it, that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. For one, it takes a whole lot of generations to get genomic effect. And in fact, in single sperm studies, we know that you've got to go through about 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 9th generational changes to see any sort of genomic effect. And in females, it's going to be even worse because the ovary lags behind the adult exposures. It's not quite as true in sperm. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense that that would be the main way in which you kind of respond to your evolutionary stress or environment because that just takes way too many generations to do. And even if we look at things where we say, well, we don't have to wait for just one nucleotide change, we can actually see micro deletions or micro expansions or copy number variants that we're all running in clinics now. When we see these copy number variants, those don't even occur all that often. They occur a little bit more frequently than stable single nucleotide polymorphisms, but not as frequently as we need to. So what's kind of the mechanism by which we turn these genes on or off in a very predictable fashion and can rapidly respond to our environment? It's epigenomics. Now we think about epigenomics typically as DNA methylation, but that's just a small part of the epigenomic variations that go on. I'll show you our data in primates that says it's probably the histone modifications which are a little bit more stable, mean a little bit more in terms of the big spectrum of turning genes off and on. 
DNA methylation events certainly do occur. There's also non-coding RNAs. And so these non-coding RNAs, I like to think of them as um, they're like Legos that sit down. And these long non-coding, especially long non-coding RNAs that work in plants, meaning they function on another chromosome or another part of a chromosome, are very, very interesting because we think they're, re they're reasons by which we silence large portions of the genome. Interestingly, the uh, uh, most unique expanded um, non-coding RNA cluster that's known to, to exist occurs um, only in primates and only in the placenta. Mm -hmm. So we think that it's really important in terms of environmental health. We just published a paper not long ago where we showed that it turns out there are micro RNAs, so these smaller non-coding RNAs in breast milk, and they actually hone in on metabolic pathways in babies. So we actually think that they may actually function ex utero, in which um, we secrete these non-coding RNAs in lipids of breast milk, they're then taken in by the baby, they're absorbed through the GI tract because they're stable across the acid flux in the stomach, and it may be a way that we re regulate metabolic pathways in the babies. Interestingly, we did kind of a cool study where we brought women into our CNRC, we put them on high-fat diets, high-sugar diets, blah, 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 and only on a high-fat diet do they appreciably change the non-coding RNAs in their breast milk, and so we think that that may actually be another unique stressor for kids in a way of communicating. So what are the different ways we can actually study what the effects of these epigenomic variations are on kids? So we do a lot in primates, and the reason we do a lot in primates is we think there's something special about just having one offspring and just having one uterus, and that may not extend all the time into other animal model systems. So we kind of went for the big money and went into primates. And there's, it's a good reason. So we've had this huge phenotypic variation over 30 to 35 million years of primate evolution. I say, you know, kind of half jokingly, we've had opposable thumbs for at least 35 million years, but it took us a long time to figure out how to smoke. Um, but it's true, we have these dramatic variations in primate evolution, and we cannot possibly explain that in the less than 1% of our coding DNA that's different between the two monkeys. And so we have to start thinking about other ways. As obstetricians, we know that evolution, even in the state of Texas, we don't really think that evolution is part of a master plan, but um, evolution occurs one generation at a time. It happens because a mom and a dad see a certain amount of stress, and that has to actually be passed on pretty rapidly or else the whole point of evolution is kind of lost. And, and we just have finished looking at the marmoset genome, which is the cute little monkeys with the whiskers you see at the zoos. They're my favorites. And they're really cool because they always have twins or triplets. They never, ever have a singleton pregnancy, so we had to figure that out. But it turns out what's super, super cool about marmosets is they're the first New World monkey we sequence. And in New World monkeys, we know there's a massive amount of positive selection that went on, and then it kind of stopped for a little while, and then we picked it up again when we went into the apes. And so we think that these positive selective mechanisms may be functioning on whole lineages, but they kind of stop for a while. And so it's another level of indirect evidence that um, epigenomic variations are In our laboratory, we focus on a number of different um, model systems by which we can study these epigenomic variations that I had mentioned. Today we're going to talk about our work on smoking, we're going to talk about our work on high-fat um, diets and obesity. So again, what are these epigenomic variations? So the idea is that chromatin can be semi-permanently modified. And it can be modified through a couple of different ways, the most common of which is taking away or adding acetyl groups, or taking away or adding methyl groups. And the main thing that acetylation does is it adds about a 42 Dalton charge to a histone molecule. Now, that means a lot. For example, if you're a blood group antigen and you add a 42 Dalton charge, you really basically go, go from being Rh negative to Rh positive. So we code it differently, but it's the same kind of gross effect. So adding these charges change a lot of what you do because it really changes how that DNA can actually be packaged. And it changes whether or not those nucleosomes stack really tightly one across the other, and what that means in terms of regulating DNA level changes is really important. These are collectively called the histone.
histone code, and so when you read papers and they say there's histone code modification, in this situation we're talking about these changes to chromatin, not DNA methylation, but actually changes to the chromatin structure itself. And as I mentioned, these are what gives us our on or off switches at the gene transcription level. Now there's a lot of different ways we can choose to study these high level changes that go on in any form of science. And we add the word omics and suddenly it's a science. So we used to call this, you know, fission. Um, and we used to get penalized in study section if we had too much fish bait in our grants. Now we get rewarded because we call omics and discovery based research. So it's just, you know, we'll show that eventually all is there and love more. Um, and so when we're looking at a genome level, this is genomics, all right? The next kind of level of change that we start to see when we have modified chromatin or methylated DNA is epigenomics or changes upon the genome itself. Once that gene is expressed, an on or off switch is turned on, then we do transcriptomics, and from there we have proteomics and metabolomics. We spend a lot of time in my lab bookending this, so we look at changes in the epigenome, and then we go all the way up to the metabolome, because we don't want to chase down some change in the epigenome that doesn't actually change any metabolite downstream. That's just like way too much work for us. We like to play a little bit more than that. So we really try to book in our research so we know where we end up, so we don't waste too much time at the starting point when we do it. And we'll talk about how we actually integrate these massive DNA, or these massive data sets at the very end. So nature has some very predictable um, uh, uh, observations that we've all made. And generally, when we're looking at kind of how things occur at a scientific level, most of the time that tapestry is going to get weaved woven with very predictable threads. In other words, you can't make a beautiful piece of tapestry with a bunch of extremely short threads because you never know how they're going to come together until the very end. So that tapestry has to be woven with long threads. And nature does that very predictably as well. And so nature's tapestry is really using the same mechanisms over and over again to change how you're going to turn these genes on or off. And I want to just give this in a schematic version and then tell you kind of in, in condensation um, about large number of uh, uh, publications that have occurred, some from my lab and a lot from others' labs as well. In general, euchromatin or open chromatin structure is associated with gene activation and closed chromatin structure is associated with gene silencing. It's that same principle that allows us to do karyotypes on an amniocentesis, right? The reason we can actually look and get a good karyotype on a fetus is because for the most part, that chromatin's pretty open. And in fact, we prove that a lot of different ways, but it turns out that's not. But for the most part, that fetus is really prone to constantly being turned, genes turned on. And that may be one of the reasons why these in utero windows are so uh, predictably responsive in the fetus, why that fetus is so prone to changes, is because in general, its chromatin structure is open, and it's kind of ripe for all kinds of modifications that go on. And in fact, we've learned something about what modifications actually occur. So we did a large number of screens, and the type of screening we did was on an epigenome-wide level. It's called chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing, or CHIP-seq analysis. We did massive amounts of CHIP-seq analysis, and it turns out that there's a modification that's relatively unique in terms of its prevalence to fetal life, and it occurs in a number of different metabolically active tissues, such as the liver. And it's when you add an acetyl group to the H3 tail, specifically on lysine 14. And those lysine 14 acetyl groups over time is part of what enables the chromatin to stay open and probably enables subsequent DNA methylation events to occur. And that is best um, descriptive, or best shown here schematically because that, we think, is part of the way that that remethylation of the fetal epigenome that was talked about occurs. So how can we think about this in a bigger, broader, three-dimensional structure? So DNA is embedded in chromatin. It's what actually gives DNA a cis and a trans face, an accessible and a non-accessible face. 
And if we look at that kind of end-on-end -end and think as, as three-dimensional people, what we see is that the DNA is wrapped around the histone core, that perfect octree. You guys remember that from your biochemistry exams in med school? So it's wrapped around that perfect histone octamer. And there's one little part that's special, and that's right here. This is called the H3 tail. It actually protrudes out. And in good X-ray crystallography structures, we know that that H3 tail is what actually enables a chromatin to pack or not pack. And in fact, if we delete off that H3 tail in yeast and totally get rid of it, it doesn't know what to do. And it just kind of sits there all scrunched up together. And eventually those we sell look, don't look so good and then they die off. So we know that's absolutely critical for maintaining the integrity of the genome. And as I mentioned, there's covalent histone modification sites, and we have found that specifically in the fetus, lysine 14 is one of those sites. So how did we actually figure that out? So we went in to build a primate model, and I'll tell you, I started working on this model at the end of my residency, the beginning of my fellowship. I'd actually worked with monkeys for many years. I worked on chlamydia as an undergraduate in Dorothy Patton's lab at the University of Washington. If you want a, you know, an absolute uh, showstopper when you're interested in dating a guy, tell him that you work with chlamydia monkeys, and that will totally shut the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, so I loved working with monkeys for many, many, many years, and so we built out this model with Kevin Grove. Um, there's three of us who still work on it, so we continuously funded for nine years, and we now have quite a few animals. We have just over 100 animals that we've been able to bring into this cohort over the years that we've done this. And what we do is we take our moms. And we put them on one of two diets. We put them on a control diet that's 13% fat. Or we put them on what we call the Great American Diet, which is a 36 to 30, 35 to 36% fat diet. They're relatively isocaloric. So the number of calories aren't that different. It's just how we get the calories in there is we put in fats or non-fats. And um, we take our animals, we mate them. Um, keeping very common social structures, and we don't disrupt their social structures. This is a nice anti-anxiety model. There's a long story as to how we had to figure that all out. But, um, and then we look at them in subsequent years on the diet, when they go from being overweight to actually being obese. Now, when we started this work, we thought we would be doing research on obesity. And it turns out we ended up doing research on high-fat dietary. It's a great example. When you just sit back and observe stuff, you're like, oh, gosh darn, it's not what I thought it was going to be. It's way cooler than that. So we figured that out a couple of ways. First of all, it turns out that not every, ant, not every primate, just like in humans, actually gets obese when you're put on a high-fat diet. And about 20 to 30% of our animals never become obese. They stay lean despite the number of years on diet. Now everybody says, well, is that just because they have more energy expenditure? We do know that the ones that stay lean do have more energy expenditure. We actually don't know if that's adaptive or not. There's a lot of argument in human literature that says some of us, the reason, you know, we, every one of us has a different response. If you give some of us a high caloric dense meal, we'll like go to sleep. You give others of us a caloric dense meal, we'll like run around like crazy. So we do know that there is different adaptive responses that occur, but that does not explain all of our effects. Um, and so we were actually able to take these very natural cohorts of some moms being obese, some moms being lean on high fat diet exposure, and be able to tease out some of the questions we had from the earlier talk today. Is it kind of this maternal environment of being obese versus non-obese, or is it actually the diet the environmental exposure that has something to do with it. Um, I will mention that these animals are not diabetic. We work very, very hard to prevent them from being diabetic. And the second that they start looking diabetic, we take them out of those cohort designations. And only about 15% of our animals become diabetic. We also have a fourth cohort that we've been able to introduce over time that's now up to about 23 animals. Um, where we actually take moms that have become obese and we put them back on a control diet. And um, so we're able to study the effects of obesity separate from high fat dietary exposure. And we call this our diet reversal cohort. So what happens to the offspring when they see a high fat diet in pregnancy? Well, they develop non-alcoholic fatty liver and 
they do so very, very predictably. So shown on the right is an oil red stain. And so when you oil red stain tissue, um, the nuclei will stain blue black with the red around them. And so this is classic example of non-alcoholic fatty liver. How quickly does it happen? Well, in as little as one year on a high fat diet, so the first pregnancy exposure on a high fat diet, we start to see this non-alcoholic fatty liver developing in the offspring. Does it persist? Yes, it does. So we can take, we now have um, some of the offspring that are just approaching four years of age. And we know if we do it by biopsy or when we actually sacrifice out these animals and do necropsy on them, they still have non-alcoholic fatty liver way down the road. So it's not just something that happens immediately after gestation. And even if those animals, those offspring are put on a controlled diet, they will still manifest some levels of non-alcoholic fatty liver. So what does that mean in terms of the epigenomics? So very early on, we did a series of experiments in which we screened for every known histone modification that existed and said, did that happen in offspring who were exposed to a high-fat diet in utero? So controlled diet exposed animals are in gray. High fat diet exposed animals are in red. These are looking at a panel of methylation variants on the histone H3 tail. Um, we looked at a total, I think there were about 34, 35 when all was said and done. And we didn't really see anything predictably happening in terms of histone methylation in these offspring. They all kind of looked the same. There was a trend towards something interesting, but nothing ever reached statistical significance. But that wasn't true to acetylation. And in fact, if we looked at acetylation on lysine 9 on the H3 tail, lysine 14, or lysine 18, both on lysine 9 and lysine 14, we saw predictable changes in terms of hyperacetylation in response to maternal high fat diet exposure. Now, it turns out we understand now a little bit more why this lysine 9 and lysine 14 go together. And that's because we eventually found the machinery that was responsible for those changes, and we'll get to that in a minute. But suffice it to say, predictably, over and over again, we saw increased acetylation on lysine 14 in offspring of moms that were exposed to a high fat diet. We then did a little bit of a trick to try to characterize this a bit better. And this was a great example of um, observational science, even when you're post call. So we used to run out these experiments on big, huge, what we called sequencing gels. So back in the day, before we had high frequency sequencing that we do all well now, we used to, um, like when I was in grad school, we used to have to run DNA sequencing gels and we'd have to read bands. And it would take you literally months to sequence a single gene because you'd run out these massive sequencing gels. And one of the tricks to them is, for those of you guys who've been in the lab, it's almost impossible now to mix up your red and black electrodes because the tops only fit on the canisters one way. But, but back in the old days, you just could never mix them up. So one day I was post-call and I was doing this for another experiment, and I mixed up my red and black electrodes. And when I did that, I went, oh, crud, now I've just lost days and days of work. But I started thinking about them, and I was like, it's actually kind of interesting. I wonder if I actually threw in enough of a negative charge into the buffer, I could still get separation instead of my molecular weight, my charge, and my protein. And so that's exactly what we did. We ended up running a series of acidic urea gels in which we were able to now separate protein solely based on charge and not by molecular weight because we acidified it enough. And we came back and blotted with antibodies to histone modifications. And we looked at this entire channel of histone modifications. What we were able to find is that it was solely lysine 14 on the H3 tail that was explaining these changes in acetylation that got me off. And as I mentioned to you, every time you have a settled group, you have about a 42 Dalton charge. This was our original poor man's way, and I'll show you that as time and funding got better, we were actually able to do this in a much more sophisticated analysis. But those initial observations still stand, which is that we see increased acetylation on the lysine, uh, on the H3 tail, specifically at lysine 14 in response to maternal high fat diet exposure. So this is all well and interesting. It's kind of like, you know, kissing somebody while you're driving, and you better pay attention to who you're kissing more than where you're driving. Um, and so we said, all right, that's 
that's fascinating that we're seeing these changes to these acetyl groups. This means something to reprogramming the epigenome. But what does it mean to that developing fetus? How is this changing all the genes that gets turned on and off? And so there are a number of different ways that we can go about figuring all of that out. Um, but our very first step has to be in understanding, well, how does this actually occur? If we observe this change in adding a set of groups, it's got to be because we've done something to the machinery that's responsible for it. So there's really two possible mechanisms by which this occurs. Either you add an acetyl group more than you should, or you fail to remove a acetyl group when you should, right? That's the only way you can end up with more of something is either more gets added or less gets taken away. So we said, all right, so let's go ahead and figure out what of those two things are occurring. So it turns out trying to figure out a mechanism of something isn't the easiest thing to do. But if you do enough screens, if you take enough of a 30,000 foot view of something, you'll eventually figure out what's actually going on. So we use something called multi-time of flight mass spectrometry to eventually figure out what was actually being the mechanism that does it. And I want to mention this, especially in this group, um, and to any folks who are young in their careers or training, as a good example of maybe you can use a high throughput um, technology to help you really get in and narrow down mechanism. It turns out a lot of the time of flight um, mass spectrometry that goes on is the stuff we use all the time to figure out what environmental um, contaminants are in any given sample. It's not that different from what we do. And the reason why we use this is because it allows us to spectrally separate proteins in a really, really unique way. And in addition, it gives us the advantage of being able to very specifically quali uh, quantitate the amount of changes that are going on. All right. So when we ran our initial time of flight mass spectrometry experiments with our offspring of our monkey tissue, we um, were able to put in artificial peptides and see once again that we were seeing the biggest spikes around the lysine 14 variation of the H3 tail. So then we said, well, why is this happening? So if it's just because we're adding a, an acetyl group, um, then when we turn around and look at a diet reversal change, we should be able to coordinate the amount of acetylation we're seeing with the amount of the machinery that gets turned on and turned off. So our first pass analysis led us to looking for histone deacetylase activity. And what we saw was very coordinately, if we have animals that are exposed to a high fat diet, we see increases in the amount of lysine 14 acetylation on the H3 tail in their offspring. If we allow the moms to stay obese, but we put them on a control diet, that then goes back down, so we know that this is a dietary effect. And I won't show you the data, but it doesn't matter if the mom's resistant or sensitive, we still see these changes in lysine 14 acetylation. And if we turn around and look at activity, as yet but with a histone deacetylase, we see the inverse, meaning that it's loss of deacetylase activity that's likely accounting for this. So um, we said, okay, well, it could still be that there's something to do with histone acetyl transferase or adding on the acetyl groups. So we ran a large series of assays, and that actually never coordinated out. It didn't matter whether we took looked at expression of known histone acetyl transferases or activity of known histone acetyl transferases, that did not coordinate well. So we said, well, there's a number of different known histone deacetylases out there. Let's just look and see if expression of any of those known histone deacetylases looks. And so we actually used a um, microarray um, in this day and age. We would now use RNA sequencing analysis. And what we found was that there was one cluster on the microarray that became very microarray that became interesting for us. We found that the search winds were changed in terms of their expression in response to maternal high fat diet exposure. So the search winds are interesting. Well, you guys may not realize, but you actually know quite a bit about search winds because they are the target of resveratrol. And so the search winds are responsible um, for uh, regulating the association between mitochondrial activity and energy expenditure at a cellular level. And CERT and resveratrol, which is the active ingredients, or one of the active ingredients in the chi berries, um, and in red wine, and is in clinical trials for metabolic syndrome, um, turns around and uh, is a pharmacologic activator. In addition, if you take mice and you overexpress 
CERT1 in a trans gene, you actually can protect those mice from developing adult non-alcoholic fatty liver. So we were kind of excited when we found the CERT1. We said, well, isn't this interesting? That's really fascinating. The problem was, when we started this work, nobody knew they were histone deacetylases. They knew they were protein deacetylases, but nobody knew if they were histone deacetylases, so we had to actually figure that out. So we did a series of experiments, all of these are published, um, in which we uh, again used our time of light mass spectrometry analysis, and we isolated and purified CERT1 using two different mechanisms. We purified it out of the vitro cultures, and then we made a purified in a cell line. And if we add resveratrol, what we see is that if we put in a lysine 14 histone peptide and add in CERT1, we start to see this loss of this by about 42 daltons of that activity. So here's a K14 peptide that sits in its normal settled state. If we add in CERT1, we drop down 42 daltons, meaning that it has to have histone deacetylase activity. If we don't have any peptide, we don't see that, which was important to prove that we were bringing something in with our purified CERT1. If we then turn around and make a mutant CERT1, where we lose the um, enzymatic domain of this protein, we now actually lose the activity of uh, against the H3 peptide. So if we take these cells, we transfect in a mutant CERT1, even when we add resveratrol, they no longer are effective at being a um, deacetylase. So this was nice because it demonstrated for the first time that CERT1s aren't just protein deacetylases, they're histone deacetylases. So we then had to go and bring out CERT1 um, from uh, our uh, cellular lysates in our monkey liver, and if we immunoprecipitate CERT1 from our monkey livers, we actually are able to show very nicely that we have a um, diminished activity of CERT1, resulting in that increase in acetylation. So what that told us was our machinery that accounts for this increase in acetylation in our, the offspring of our high fat diet exposed animals is in fact a sirtuin in CERT1, which was not going to be a host in deacetylase. It doesn't just happen at the activity level, it also happens because you alter the expression of CERT1, as shown here, and it also happens at the protein level. So you have less CERT1 gene turned on and you have diminished activity as a result. And in fact, it's not only limited to sirtuin, but it actually affects all of its downstream activators, including the steroid responsive genes, PGC1, which is a well-known um, transcription factor that turns on and off a whole bunch of lipid genes, and adiponectin. All of those are influenced by these changes in sirtuins. So why does this actually matter? So I'm going to give you a clinical example as to why we think that this is an important thing to look at. And we're going to talk specifically about hypothyroidism and the epidemic of obesity. So we've known for a long time that hypothyroidism and obesity go hand in hand, but not totally so. You can certainly have people who are hypothyroid and not obese, and you can have certainly have people who are obese and not hypothyroid. But what we do know is that correlation is a little bit tighter in kids than it is in adults. And if you have a child with non-alcoholic fatty liver, about 80% of the time it'll also be hypothyroid. So we are curious if on a physiologic level these changes we were seeing with respect to sirtuin activity and increased acetylation in H3 had something to do with a physiologic change in the offspring. And so we looked at thyroid metabolism. Why we didn't see any variation, this will be very comfortable for OBGYNs because we look at free thyroid hormones all the time, why we didn't see any change in maternal free T4 or free T3. Um, what we found was that when we looked at the fetus, the story got fascinating. So the fetal free T3 levels were absolutely unchanged based upon whether or not that fetus saw a high fat or a controlled diet. But if we looked at whether or not the fetus saw high thyroid control diet at free T4 levels, what we saw was that there was a statistically significant and probably meaningful level of change of free T4 in the fetus in response to maternal high fat dietary exposure. This was due to the diet, because when we reverse that diet, still letting the mom be obese, we 
you saw a return um, to uh, normal levels. Now, somebody could argue, well, you saw a little bit of changes in free T4 in the mom, so we actually controlled for that using Fisher Z transformation. So we looked at the maternal levels in paired sets and said, well, it can't be due to the maternal free T4 because those slopes of the lines are very different. And so it's got to be due to the free T3 levels, and if, or free T4 levels in the fetus. And in fact, when we look at a whole spectrum of different um, downstream responses physiologically to free T4 in the fetus, we also see that those are disrupted with maternal high fat diet exposure. So why does this occur? Well, it turns out that there are a number of different genes that are responsible for regulating thyroid hormone production in a fetus. It's important to remember that the fetus itself doesn't actually make any form of thyroxin until at least 20 weeks of gestation. And children don't have in intact hypothalamic axes until about six to nine months of age ex utero. So their ability to regulate their production of thyroid hormones is really dependent upon the mom for a long period of time. Um, but by the second trimester of pregnancy, that fetus is allowing for peripheral conversion of thyroid hormones. And so when we were trying to figure out why the fetal thyroid axis was potentially disrupted, we had to look at a number of different genes that are involved in this. Now, we specifically wanted to ask questions about which thyroid axis genes are being reprogrammed and was it doing through, through um, uh, epigenomic modifications. So there are two genes, DIO2 and DIO3, which were, we knew were being altered in maternal high fat diet exposure. And those genes are responsible for converting non-active to active forms of free T3 or to free T4. And what we saw was in the thyroid gland itself, the high fat diet exposure increased the activity of both DIO2 and DIO3. And in the hypothalamus, we saw the reverse in DIO3, suggesting that the hypothalamic axis was permanently disrupted in these animals because it should actually be going the other direction. If we look within the liver itself, what we found was again that the genes that are responsible for converting thyroid hormone in the fetal liver were completely disrupted with maternal high fat dietary exposure. Um, and when we ask the question, what about other genes that are known to be involved all the way from the hypothalamus to the production of T4 and T3, which of those genes were disrupted in response to maternal high fat diet exposure? And uniformly, all of them were disrupted in response to maternal high fat diet exposure. Now, so why was this actually happening? Well, maybe it was some of these same mechanisms that we saw occurring at an epigenomic level in the fetus. Um, and in fact, it became, the thyroid hormone axis became a very, very good candidate. And that's because a series of nuclear hormone receptor um, elements are known to be responsible for turning on and off the hypothalamic axis and specifically thyroid hormone, or specifically thyroid hormone production. And most of them function through the thyroid hormone um, receptor uh, beta subunit. And so, for example, when you have active um, thyroid hormone and you add in T3, that's actually when you can see differential acetylation of the TR beta gene, which is responsible for how you open up that region and enable transcription. So it became a good test case for us as to whether or not these epigenomic modifications we're seeing at the level of the whole epigenome had anything to do with actual physiologic production. And that is exactly what we found, was that fetal hepatic TR beta was being increased with the maternal high fat diet exposure, both at a gene expression level as well as a protein level. When we asked the question, what's actually driving this increase in TR beta? Was it having too much repressor, too much activator or the reverse? And did it have anything to do with DNA methylation? We went on and did modified chip seek analysis to give us the answer to this. And we went on and we did fishing. Um, with modified histone acetyl antibodies and uh, looked for our answer. The first thing I'll tell you is, as I mentioned, for the most part, the, transcri the transcriptome of the fetus is open and poised to go. This is a great example when you go into a target tissue, such as the liver, you may find that there's absolutely no change in methylation in response to a known insult. So this is every single potential methylated loci within any region 
of um, TR beta that could be differentially methylated. And there's absolutely no difference based upon maternal high fat diet exposure. So methylation changes have nothing to do with this epigenomic variation. However, that's not true when we look at changes that are responsible by um, differential acetylation of lysine 14. So if we take an antibody again against differentially acetylated lysine 14, we go fishing within the epigenome and ask what occupancy or histone code changes have occurred there. What we find is that um, within the thyroid hormone pathway, the fetal thyroid hormone response element of TR beta is specifically enriched um, for alterations in lysine 9 and lysine 14 acetylation. In other words, it is the histone code specifically at that thyroid hormone response element which is changed in in um, reflection and exposure to a maternal high fat diet. And if we go into an intron, we don't see appreciable changes the same way. So it's unique into these promoter occupancy changes. And this was one of the first examples um, uh, reported in the literature in which epigenomic variations, known changes in gene expression that had physiologic relevance, were occurring not by differential methylation of DNA, but by differential acetylation of the histones. And it was important to us that we be able to very, very clearly trace this down onto these histone variations. And so we actually looked at every part of the repressor complex that's involved in thyroid, in regulation of thyroid hormone metabolism. And across the board, the histone code modifications that we observed in response to a maternal high fat diet was what was changing the occupancy or changing the histone code of those proteins and we could not account for the observed alterations in transcriptional in any way other than the histone modifications. Um, and, uh, and that um, is solely due to a maternal high fat diet because if we take our animals that are just obese and we put them back on a control diet, we no longer see this effect. And if we have the lean and obese moms exposed to a high fat diet, we see this in the fetus across the board. This has much bigger ramifications because if we take genes that are known to be further downstream from thyroid hormone, what we find is in each and every case, these are also altered in response to maternal high fat diet exposure. And if we look at um, uh, uh, this in the liver, in the hypothalamus, or in the thyroid gland, we see this completely disrupted, which is good evidence that we've changed that fetal epigenome, we've changed that histone code. No matter where we look at that thyroid hormone, pathway, whether we start at the top of the brain all the way down to the liver, those disrupted changes result in meaningful differences at the fetal level. So we did this with two other genes that we picked up through our high throughput screens and we're able to show that not only do we have changes in the histone code in the fetus in response to maternal high fat diet, but it means something in terms of physiologic pathways that are linked to obesity. We also looked at genes that have no known association to obesity and we did not see these same changes. So there's something that's happening uniformly, and we think it happens in the search ones. All right, so we're gonna close with just a brief discussion about, so is it all epigenomics, and then a model system where we ask the question, are there instances where the genetic backbone and epigenomic changes come together to render susceptibility? And uh, we did this in humans. We chose to look at maternal tobacco exposure. It's a single modifiable perinatal risk factor that we're aware of today. Um, and we chose to look at it for a number of different reasons. First of all, obviously, um, there's a reduced mean infant birth weight. But not every baby that's exposed to tobacco smoke will be growth restricted, right? We don't see that clinically yet. Um, it does give us increased risks of having a small for gestational age baby, preterm birth, pregnancy loss, and placental abruption. It also gives us a decreased risk of preeclampsia, and that some of that accordant risk may be because you have a higher early pregnancy loss, so pregnancy that may be prone to developing preeclampsia may be lost early, but that's not the sole definition. All right, so there are a number of different mechanisms that have been ex um, uh, proposed to explain why smoking results in a growth restricted fetus. And so one of them is vasoconstriction, but again, not every fetus that's exposed to tobacco ends up being growth restricted. 
Placental perfusion simply interferes with the placental perfusion response. Still doesn't explain the differential susceptibility, nor does the <coughs> carbon monoxide ketohemoglobin binding. So we were curious whether maternal or fetal metabolic gene polymorphisms or epigenetic mechanisms may explain both the phenotypic susceptibility as well as the mechanism of smoke exposure. So we chose to do a modified GWAS analysis in which we um, took uh, women who've been enrolled in the maternal fetal medicine unit network, Factor V Leiden study. And we chose this study because it was a very, very large cohort, 5,188 moms were enrolled, and they gave unrestricted permission for future genetic testing, which is a very, very important thing to think about when you're doing this type of work. And we took these that were in maternal fetal pairs, we did one-to-one -one match controls, we had 502 smokers, 502 non-smokers, and verified it with serum coding analysis. And then we did genomic data extraction and blinded genotyping, and ultimately got to the point where we found a um, gene that if it was deleted in the fetus, rendered susceptibility to growth restriction specifically among smokers. And this is the interaction p-value with uh, less than 0.001, which just means that when we plot out a birth weight ratio, so this gives us the ability to adjust for gestational age. So if you are eight pound, one ounce, at 40 weeks, you would have a birth weight ratio of one. Actually, you have 1.01, because that's a little bit higher than the mean national average. But if you weigh four pounds, 11 ounces, at 35 weeks, your birth weight ratio would be lower. So it's a way that we use that statistically to normalize my gestational age. But what we found was, if we looked at fetuses that don't have a deletion in a gene called GSTT1, that in response to smoking, they did not have an appreciable difference in their birth weight ratios. However, if the fetus had a deletion in GSTT1 and they were the product of a smoker, they then had a statistically different birth weight ratio. But non-smoker GSTT1 deleted fetuses did not. So this was, long perturbations of data later, this was a great example of when you had a genetic, genomic susceptibility in those signs that have been published. Well, what is interesting about this is that it feeds back into the um, aromatic hydrocarbon pathways that we learned about earlier today. So the uh, most common way people get exposed to high levels of aromatic hydrocarbons is when they smoke. It's not environmental exposure, it's, it's personal smoking. Um, and there's really two genes that are instrumental for breaking down the aromatic hydrocarbons. CYP1A1 actually makes the VAGGU, the reactive intermediate, and then GSTT1 turns around and makes it so it gets excreted. It's a very simple um, two-step uh, uh, metabolism. So we had showed that a fetal GSTT1 deletion, in other words, your inability to get rid of these adducts, rendered susceptibility to growth restriction in the setting of smoking. But what it didn't explain was how you ended up with more reactive intermediates in the first place in response to smoking. And so to make a long story short, we looked at CYP1A1 in our same GWAS and found no association once we controlled for, for multiple testing. So we said, well, maybe that's because CYP1A1 is doing something epigenetically, which makes more of the bad stuff. And then if you're missing that delete, if you're missing GSTT1 or you're deleted in it, then you can't get rid of the bad stuff once you made it. And in fact, it turns out that's exactly the case. And so what we found was when we looked specifically in placental tissue of smokers, CYP1A1 um, was increased in its expression in the placenta. And if we look at other metabolic pathway genes, um, we did not see that actually occur. And so then we could ask, well, what does that actually mean um, in terms of how it's regulated? And so here's an example when there is differential methylation. So we went and we looked at, um, I think this was about 6,000 different sequencing clone reactions by the time they're all done. But we looked at every single CPG dinucleotide that could possibly be methylated in the non cyp one one promoter. And it's a very, very well characterized promoter. What we found was that there was diminished methylation in smokers relative to non-smokers. In other words, 
the gene was turned on because you had less methylation in the turn off, turn on region of CYP1A1. And in fact, we were able to find the exact same region that contains known transcriptional response elements or XRE elements within that CYP1A1 gene that was differentially methylated in response to smoking in the placenta. And moreover, if we go in and sting for both CYP1A1 as well as known reactive um, uh, um, radicals within the placenta, what we found was that we saw very, very nice differences between smokers and non-smokers. So it was a great example of the CYP1A1 gene gets turned on, its activity gets increased, there's more protein around, and it's related specifically to methylation around a known DNA response element in its promoter. And so this is a good example of when you can have both a genetic and an epigenetic change come together to give a meaningful phenotypic response to a environmental exposure. So you'll hear a lot of people talk about, we like to do gene by environment interaction studies. This is a gene epigene environment interaction study. We came across, and I didn't give you guys the whole story because it's really long and drawn out, but we came across it by doing a full series of omics experiments to get us into the right loci. And the right loci ended up being a fetal deletion in GSTT1 and a placental epigenomic modification to CYP1A1. So in other words, you make more CYP1A1 because you decrease the methylation of its promoter. That gives you more bad stuff, more DNA adducts that the fetus cannot deal with if it's missing the GSTT1 gene, if it's deleted in that. And so one question people ask is, so how common is this GSTT1 deletion? It's a very common polymorphism. About 27% of the population has this polymorphism. So no, you can't run around and figure out whether women have it and tell them it's okay to smoke. Because for one, you don't know if its fetus will be deleted unless they get an thesis. And that would make a whole lot of sense at some point. All right. Um, so in summary, um, our data suggests that fetal epigenetic signatures are altered by in utero exposures. They're altered in very predictable fashions. Um, and then as we continue to do this in other broader settings, we're really going to be able to figure out what's the genomic susceptibility low sign, what are the epigenomic variations that occur, and what do they mean in terms of whole body physiology. And so, you know, just like we did the example in the monkey, if we said, great, here's a big, large-scale epigenomic variation, what's that mean in terms of any given gene pathway? We really had to go to the thyroid and say, oh, okay, this is a physiologic explanation. This starts to gel into a whole big picture niche. So many people ask, where is our lab heading? So what we really like to do is think about human developmental genomics. And so just to give you a little bit of a preview, the way we think about it is we have a certain amount of what we inherit that we can't change all that much. We get what we get from mom and dad. Um, and that's about 23,000 genes worth of DNA. Our epigenome is the first level of plasticity by which we as individuals can change what we've inherited. We change it at the histone code level. We change it at the DNA methylation level. Our metagenome is like you know, plasticity on steroids. So we get about 23,000 genes or so from our parents, and we get somewhere in the neighborhood about 10 million genes or so from our bacteria and counterparts that live on us each and every day and do a lot for us. And the transcriptome is really where we see this convergence of plasticity occur. All right, I'm going to skip through that. So um, none of this happens without a really, really awesome um, cadre of people in my laboratory. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple of different folks that for the for the um, folks in training here. So Katie Anthony is just starting her second year as an MFM fellow. She's doing microbiome work in my lab. Doesn't have a strong science background, but you know, we pick her up with some science buddies and she does just great. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Amber Andres has uh, contributed to quite a bit of our epigenomic work. She was a um, uh, just finished her undergraduate work at Washington University and came to us on a um, underrepresented scholarship and worked with us for two years and is now starting that school. Um, and then uh, Malika Cuevas um, contributed to some of our placental epigenomics work. She's a neonatal fellow. 
Um, and then we have some very traditional scientists in our lab. Um, so our postdocs are Rod, a couple of us, Jude Ma, Allen, and um, we have two new postdocs joining the lab that will be focusing on our epigenomic work. Um, uh, I have a large number of uh, friends and collaborators that I could not do any of this without, and I always thank the National Institutes of Health. Um, they have supported me since uh, I was a graduate student, um, and I have been incredibly lucky. We also get independent funding um, through the Girls Welcome Fund and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'm happy to take questions or give any clarifications. It's a pretty thick 
makes the behavioral phenotype. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting. So we never have problems with them. It's just maybe adults to take the diet the first time. We usually, we usually have to do a rounding of about three to four months before we plan the pregnancies. Put the cohort on. Once they're on it, they don't like it taken away. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Great, great uh, information. I'm wondering how much of the smoking data that you have you think might also um, be, I guess, recapitulated based on it environmental exposure to PAHs because, you know, for those of us who do smoking research, a lot of the feedback that you'll get is, well, why don't we just tell people to stop smoking? And it's not, as we all know, that cut and dry and easy, but it, I think yeah. it makes the results even more powerful to say, well, there are these unescapable exposures that we all have, especially in large urban populations, that could also be mediating an effect through these pathways. Yeah, so we, we think that our smoking data is pretty much focused on the aromatic hydrocarbon pathway. We did a, a genome-wide screen for this, and the only things that came up interesting were in known aromatic hydrocarbon pathways. So we know it's in the PAH pathway. Um, we did get a little bit of a hit off of CYP2A6, which is responsible for nicotine to codeine conversion, um, but we only got that in African Americans, and which isn't surprising because um, this, so the CYP2A6, if you have the mutation in it, you, um, you smoke more because you're a faster converter to codeine. And it's one of the few racially dimorphic um, SNPs that we're aware of in the population. It's much, much higher in African Americans. It's part of the reason they've been hypothesized that Newports are a very popular cigarette in African American special menthol newports is because you get a bigger nicotine hit when you smoke them. So that's why people do do smoking cessation work clinically. Always ask patients what you smoke. If they like smoke Marlboro Lights, you know, you're going to have better success than if they smoke newport menthol. They're a lot harder and maybe far more nicotine patch. So we got a little bit of a hit, but nothing really significant. Our hits were all in the aromatic hydrocarbon. So we think that those are very focused. And for those of you guys that might have seen, um, NIHS just released a series of white papers around looking at environmental exposures in pregnancy. And one of the white papers was the one we did on smoking. And so um, in it, we specifically say, 